If I say the word freedom of speech, well probably the first thing that comes to mind if you're American is the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. If you're from Italy, that will be the 21st article of the Constitution of the Italian Republic and so on and so forth as we continue through many different countries. The concept of freedom of speech is a great and very important achievement that we reached as modern societies and as a human civilization. And it is normally something we connect to, once again, modern democracies and republics. But what about the ancient world? Well, I would say that whenever we think of, for example, a kingdom, hence monarchy as a form of government, well, in the medieval period, but also in Bronze Age monarchies, if you say something and the king doesn't like it... And yet, when we think of the classical period, well, ancient Rome was a republic. Ancient Greece, particularly Athens, for instance, was a democracy. They both had constitutions. We have the constitution written by the Athenians. When it comes to ancient Rome, yeah, they did have initially orally spoken norms and normatives, which were considered to be a form of constitution. And then later on, these also get, at least some of these get written in the famously called 12 plates. So they had constitutions, they had republics, they had democracies. Of course, these were different to the modern ones. For instance, the Athenian democracy was a form of pure democracy. And yet, modern day republics and democracies are in fact based and modeled after the ancient ones. So, did the ancient Romans, specifically the citizen, enjoy constitutionally protected freedom of speech? Well, let's get ready for a deep dive. The concept of freedom of speech within the Roman world is rather complex because on one side it appears evident, as you read the sources, that Roman citizen had the ability to speak freely in public. But on the other hand, if we want to look at it from the modern point of view, so a right that would be institutionally protected by the legal system, then we will hit a lot of grey areas within the sources. This is one of the reasons why, if we look at famous historians that debated the concept of whether or not the Romans had freedom of speech, even though you give the same exact sources and passages and verses, they'll interpret them differently and they will often end up with diametrically opposed conclusions. The reason being ambiguity. So let's see if we can manage to perhaps clear the waters here. Well, whenever we approach the concept of freedom of speech in ancient Rome, the first word in Latin that will come up in the sources is the word contio. The contio, plural contiones, were a form of public assembly more akin to an informal meeting where the magistrates could summon the people to discuss new public policy, new laws, in a sort of plenary session, so to speak. Speaking to the people was a privilege of the magistrates, never a right to the citizen. Only the magistrate who was calling the assembly had the right to address the populus. But as laws and policies were discussed, the people could express their opinions. But it was the magistrate who would tell the people who could speak, when they could speak and for how long. So even within the topic of these public assemblies, the concept of freedom of speech is rather articulated. Both Titus Livius and Dionysius of Alicarnassus tell us about a massive plenary session or assembly that was called in 446 BC. And this was requested within the city of Rome by two cities within the region of Latium because they were contending over a territory. Now, this is an important session to discuss because we see a contraposition between the two opposites within Roman society, the patricians, so the upper class, and the plebs, so the rest of the people, the common people. And as they are contending in front of the legislators, a man by the name of Publius Scaptius decides to speak in favour of the people. This, of course, upsets the patricians and the consuls force him not to speak and then want him cast out. In other words, it's one of the first examples of cancel culture and silencing. But Titus Livius tells us that not only, of course, he wanted to speak, but the people wanted to hear him. And as a way to appeal, he goes to the tribunes of the plebs and says that he wants to be able to speak, and they grant it. This might seem to be a simple story, but there is a lot to unpack. Let's see how historians discuss it. According to Andrea Andrews in the book La Repubblica delle Opinioni, he writes, It appears clear that the right of speech was something you could appeal for, in an equal way, for anyone who enjoyed Roman citizenship regardless of their status, and the fact that he was not allowed to speak constituted a violation of the libertas of the citizen. An opposite conclusion instead is brought forth by Valentina Arena. 
even if, at first glance, the intervention of the tribunes of the pleb seems to be a case of strong evidence in favour of freedom of speech as a right, the fact that Scaptius had to go to them to be able to speak freely seems to instead declare the very contrary. There was no freedom of speech and he had to ask permission to speak. So, who got it right? Well, to be able to answer that we need to dig deeper. Now, all of this is impressive and interesting and there are many other things we need to do to figure out if the Romans did have freedom of speech, but one thing the Romans didn't have was Black Friday, but luckily, you do. And what you might not know is that I offer my own merchandise and my rings with an inscription in classical Latin which reads Custos Veritatis, which means Guardian of Truth. If you like to defend historical truths based on facts, and you don't care about people who get offended by the truth, then absolutely show it. Get one of my rings and support my work. And because it's Black Friday, you'll get some incredible discounts on my rings, which you will find on the website Viking Jewelry, but also on all of the wonderful things that they offer. And absolutely click the link in the description right now. This is a time-limited offer only for this Black Friday week. A very important thing to say is that as we review Roman legal documents, there is no mention of a legally protected right when it comes to freedom of speech for a Roman citizen. With that being said, we may be able to find an answer to our question as we read Seneca. In the book Controversiae, there are several cases discussed where an individual's ability to speak freely is taken away from them as a form of punishment. In the first case, Seneca tells us about a young, good-looking Roman man who, because of a bet, decided to show himself in public dressed as a woman. As he did that, he was bullied and sexually harassed by ten men. The story goes on to tell us that he sues them, wins, has them condemned, but he himself had to receive a form of punishment. That is because even though he was a victim of violent assault, the fact that he was dressed as a woman in public was considered indecent. And his punishment, you guessed it, was the loss of the ability to speak publicly. So he lost freedom of speech. The second story or instance that Seneca tells us about is of a Roman man who discovers a traitor. He finds this rich man and suspects that he was guilty of high treason, so in order to prove it, he breaks into the rich man's house, steals some letters and brings them in front of the magistrates as a proof of said rich man's treason. So the rich man is condemned, but the magistrates also punish the man who found the traitor because, I mean, he was still a thief in their eyes. How do they punish him? They remove his ability to speak publicly. Freedom of speech is once again removed as a punishment for a crime. These two stories that Seneca chooses are important because they are considered to be extreme cases. That is because these people think or feel that they are victims themselves because they believe that the magistrates weren't being just in removing their ability to speak freely in public. Another similar set of stories that can help us frame the situation correctly within the socio-political strata of ancient Rome and its legislative system are the stories that we read in Quintilius. He tells us, in fact, of two specific class of people that would lose their freedom of speech and their ability to speak in public, specifically in connection to the contiones. Those Roman citizens who had reached bankruptcy and the children or sons of prostitutes. What all of these stories tell us is that, yes, Freedom of speech, or the ability to freely speak your mind in public, was something that the people expected to be able to do. But on the other hand, it also tells us that it wasn't legally protected, and there could be situations and instances in which magistrates, or in general, the authorities could remove this freedom of speech at their will. Now, what we have noticed so far is that even though a certain level of freedom of speech existed in ancient Rome, of course, the fact that it wasn't protected by law makes it quite different to the modern concept of freedom of speech. But there is one thing that I think is almost hilariously similar to what happens today in the oratory sphere, particularly when it comes to public speakers. To see what I'm talking about, we just need to go back to 61 BC and look at the altercation in public between Claudius and Cicero, and how these speakers could attack each other in public with very strong words, addressing each other with words such as bellua, beast, 
Carniflex, Assassin, and Mayalis, Pig. Interesting how politicians never really learn to behave. Some things never change. As we continue our investigation within the concept of freedom of speech, one of the things we do need to discuss is absolutely the concept of theatre. Because in the world of fiction, many words can be excused in a similar way to how modern day comedians and even musicians say what they want, specifically against the authorities, enjoying a certain level of artistic license. In 59 BC, during public-held games, specifically the Apollinar games, the actor Diphilus specifically pointed the finger in front of everybody to Pompey and said the words, For our great misfortune, you are great. Did he have repercussions? Was he executed? Not that we know of. And what's interesting is that this is an even more intriguing case because he wasn't a Roman citizen. He was a libertus, which means a freed man, a former slave. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, you could say whatever you wanted against anyone in power and enjoy protection. All it tells us is that it's really a case-by-case -case scenario. And the reason why I say this is because, according to Valerius Maximus, the horrible politics policy, behavior in general, and reputation of someone as infamous as Pompey was such common knowledge that if you said something against him in public, well, most people would have agreed with it. Hence, that acted as a sort of shield of protection, not the law. And we can connect this ability to speak your mind in public, even against the authorities up to a certain extent, to the Roman concept of libertas. So, a free man, as long as you were free. If you were a slave and you said something, well. Also, we need to be careful how we interpret the Roman concept of libertas and how it oftentimes overlaps with another very important concept within Roman society, which is licentia. If, up to a certain level, and in some instances, freedom of speech can be considered part of libertas, so freedom, the same way not all instances of freedom of speech can be protected by said libertas. In other words, depending on the situation, depending on who you're accusing, and most importantly, depending on who you are, the same sentence could be libertas, freedom of speech, freedom, or licentia. And this is what I'd like to focus on today. It's not really a matter of the words have protection, is it depends who says them. In this next section, we're going to discuss the three fundamental aspects that will help us decide whether a statement is going to be a form of freedom of speech or is going to be a crime in the eyes of Roman authorities. These three concepts being the status of the person speaking, the form or the way the sentence is spoken and the contents of said sentence. Quintilian tells us that the persona of whom expresses himself has a fundamental role. If his past is illustrious, if his family is noble, his age, his fortune, Quintilius tells us that we need to make sure that whatever a man says doesn't clash with who he is and what he did in his past. So what is freedom of speech for some is a crime for others. Same sentence. And this is where we expand our discussion, embracing another very important Roman social aspect, mors maiorum. Translated as the ancestral custom or way of the ancestors, this is an unwritten code from which the ancient Roman people derived their social norms and expectations. In other words, this is the core concept of Roman traditionalism and how they gained their so-called behavioral role models, which affected private, political, and military life. At the end of the day, whether it be the past or whether it be the present, the idea of challenging established authorities is always a dangerous act. And when it comes to the past, we often think of well, if you challenge the king, if you challenge the emperor, you're going to have problems. But in ancient Rome, there is one more important political figure that we need to discuss, and that is that of the censors. A censor was a magistrate in ancient Rome, but those responsible of maintaining the so-called censors, which supervised public morality. The power of a censor, when compared to other magistrates, was absolute. And once a censor made his mind and decided how to act, 
no magistrate could oppose him. And what's interesting is that the census regulation of public morality is where we get the origin of the word censor and censorship in English. As we read the sources, a rather common form of punishment which was in connection with the censors was the so-called aerarius, which is a form of demoting a Roman citizen of his citizenship. It's not that they weren't citizen anymore, but their citizenship and the rights connected to it were lessened and limited. And all a Roman censor needed to do in order to justify such a harsh punishment was to just say that he was insulted. We have an example by Aulus Gellius, who tells us of a man who was punished this way. As the censor asked, are you married? The man made a joke and he said, as he was laughing, yes, I am married, just not to the person I'd like to have as a wife. That was enough for the censor to get annoyed and demote his Roman citizenship, taking away many of his rights as a citizen. It's interesting that the same form of punishment or repercussion was used by the censors against those who indulged in the following type of crime. Convicium adversus bonomores, which means to speak loudly against the good habits or good customs. On the other side of the spectrum during the Republic, something happens when a general returns to Rome in triumph. So he's gloriously entering the city after his great victories. And as he is celebrated and given glory and honor, you often had situations in which the people, sometimes even the legionaries themselves, would sing songs towards the general to make fun of him and mock him. The reason why that wasn't considered a crime is because in the mind of Roman society, as you were elevated, as you're being celebrated and honored, in order to balance your place in society, people would mock you at the same time. So that was an exception. I really meant it when I said the situation was complex. But during the imperial period, of course, we have a form of dictatorship and it will be a case-by-case -case scenario once again, but we'll have to look at every single emperor. And there will absolutely be situations in which if you speak against the emperor, you will be executed, completely removing any trace of freedom of speech in the modern sense. Say, for example, the way Marcus Antonius had Cicero executed because of what he had said publicly. And we have many instances within the Julio-Claudian dynasty, such as Nero or Caligula, who systematically executed any opposition. So in conclusion, at least a form of freedom of speech did exist within Roman society when it came to Roman citizens and their ability to speak publicly and even sometimes criticize the powerful. With that being said, it will very much depend on who is in power, what form of government we're talking about, which specific moment within Roman history, who is speaking, what their social status is, who their family was and who they're speaking against. So in ancient Rome, you're free to say what you want but you're not free to choose what consequences what you say will have on you. But of course, this doesn't really conclude the discussion. There are many other aspects that we could choose to talk about. Freedom of religion, what about freedom of press? And we could discuss all of these in subsequent videos if you're interested. And if you are, if you liked this video and you want me to make more like this, please let me know in the comments, leave a like, subscribe and share this video with your friends. Please don't forget to check out the rings that I offer and the special offer by Viking Jewelry. And as always, thank you so much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.